Nadia was one of my students who helped kick off Fab Labs making Fab Labs. Good. Yeah, I was one of Neil's students, uh, not in the distant past. And uh, now I'm a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Yeah, I have a lab here called Machine Agency. I have um, a bunch of Slacker PhD students who aren't here yet at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that I did in Neil's crew. Um, and then I will talk a little bit, and then I'll do a little live demo, hopefully, of machines that we're working on right now. Um, one of the major differences, I think, between machine building and other kinds of development is like the amount of time that you have before you are um, satisfied, like you have something that actually works. Um, and so if you play music, for example, you press a button and it makes noise, you have immediate satisfaction. And even with software, you can write bash scripts and then you can test everything along the way, you can print and, and you can print things to the command line and you can debug in, in, in a relatively quick way. And that kind of prototyping cycle is actually gets more and more complicated, especially when you start working with machines. Um, and the amount of system integration that I'm sure you guys have all noticed that you have to do for um, connecting electrical systems to mechanical systems is non-trivial. And so I'm interested in what does it mean, not just for us to be able to build machines like they already exist, but what kind of machines, um, now that it's easy for us to prototype in mechanical devices, and it's relatively inexpensive to acquire electrical devices, um, what kind of machines might we build that don't necessarily have um, mass production as the end goal? What kind of machines can we build that um, maybe you, you would only build one or two of them? Uh, mostly I'm interested in how can you harness the precision of machines and how can you use the accuracy that computer control affords you, but not necessarily have to um, rely on mass manufacturing to offset the cost of the startup of the machine. Um, so in Neil's group, I built a lot of machines in the past to experiment with what does the future of machines look like? What does it mean to have, um, yeah, fabricators at your, at your fingertips? And, you know, spoiler alert, I eventually started disagreeing with Neil exactly what was important here. Um, but this, for example, was an experiment where I thought, well, if, if uh, the universal fabricator that you see in the replicator that you see in Star Trek is the mainframe, then what is the laptop computer of fabrication? So this was a pop-up 3D printer milling machine and cutting machine that uh, folded into this briefcase that I could carry around um, while traveling. For some reason, the TSA never asked us any questions and still doesn't ask us any questions when we travel with it. Um, but of course, this machine can only make, uh, or maybe it's non-obvious from the, from the image, but this machine can only make objects that are smaller than itself. Um, everything has to fit within the work envelope. And replicating this machine was a fair amount of work. You had to water jet all the parts, um, and you had to do all of this wiring. This is another machine that, and that machine I worked on with Alain Moyer. Um, this machine I worked on with Jonathan Ward, who should join us shortly about other machines in the pipeline. Um, but this machine was meant to be much lower cost and entirely replicatable by other people in the Fab Lab network. Um, it's made out of cutting boards. And that's another thing that I think is sort of interesting about this fabrication, uh, the fabrication possibilities that we have now. You can sort of divert economies of scale into parts that you have for, um, for machine building. So these are, for example, cutting boards. Um, cutting boards that are used for restaurants are made out of HDPE. And this is a fabrication technique for CNC milling HDPE with snap fit connections so that you can easily create the frames for the machines without necessarily having to have a lot of fasteners or um, having to rely on the precision of the person who's assembling the machine to get the, um, to get the perpendicular joints to be exactly right. However, you know, a lot of these, uh, these, these two machines in particular, you know, we released all of the build files online and we, uh, um, and, and we kind of expected that other people would want to build these machines in particular, but we were totally wrong about that. Most people who were excited about machine building wanted to build a machine that they didn't already have. Um, and so we started building instead these modular component machines. So this I started doing together with James Coleman. Uh, Instead of using, uh, instead of using uh, the sort of spiral development that Neil likes to talk about to design an entire machine, 
we wanted to have all these different modules so that the spiral that we would have to take became smaller and smaller. So you can quickly assemble, um, so you can quickly assemble with different linear and rotary stages, machine parts to, uh, machine parts to be able to have a machine that you can assemble and disassemble and reassemble into different configurations. So machine configurations. This one is set up to be um, a four axis hot wire cutter. Uh, but these modules again were made um, with a water jet cutter and folded metal. And that was, uh, I'll go back to that in a second. And that was not necessarily ideal because that meant that not everyone could make that kind of thing. Mm. And so instead we made a cardboard version, um, which a lot of people used in Fabric Academy in prior years. So that basically the idea was that in the way that you might test software by quickly writing a shell script to test whether or not something works, you can also quickly test a machine idea by making these modules um, out of uh, cardboard, assembling your machine and having at least the first minimum viable prototype of your machine within an afternoon. Um, and another, Big component of this is um, how can you prototype the controllers of machines? So machine control hasn't changed a whole lot since like the 1960s. Uh, and part of that has to do with just uh, where, um, where historically limitations lay in bandwidth and processing power. And those historical limitations are kind of gone now. Um, and so the possibility of a networked control system for different parts of your machine is, uh, is completely possible. Um, and so this is the Gestalt One network. Um, Alan and I, uh, so Alan, who I worked on PopFab with, also started the company Shaper Tools. Shaper Tools um, makes the handheld router that maybe you guys have seen that has the video, uh, that has the, the video feed on it and can register itself on, um, on the material uh, using um, this domino tape, uh, this, uh, I, I, this domino tape that helps you figure out where exactly you are on the material. And Shaper Tools recently sold to Festool. Festool being, of course, extremely cool tools from Germany. And so Alan has more time again. And so Alan and I have restarted the development of Gestalt, probably much to the chagrin of Neil, who hates Gestalt, but that's okay. Um, and uh, let me go ahead. One to, be of, fair, uh, I, to be fair, I don't hate Gestalt, but go on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the other part that I think is really important that maybe you're not going to think about too much in this, uh, in, in this particular recitation or as you go through this exercise, but that, you know, the manufacturing part or the part that you use the machine for is only one component of a pipeline of building things. So if you think about your machine as a tool to build different things, um, you know, who are the people who are building things? Where are the parts going? How do you organize the parts? Like, how do you make sure that if you're building all of the parts for a complexly curved building, how do you make sure that those parts end up in the right place? There are a lot of places where traditional manufacturing um, had a lot of, has a lot of preconceptions built in for how to use machines and what kind of machine output is possible. And I would really encourage all of you out there in Fab Academy to really rethink that, to think, is this really, um, is this method by which we're engaging with machines and building things with machines, um, does it make a lot of sense now, given all of the resources that we have at our disposal? Um, especially as digital fabrication proliferates and people start talking a lot about distributed production and distributed manufacturing and things being produced locally, um, there are a lot of things uh, that are built into quality control and assembly that really, um, really rely on sort of traditional manufacturing ideas and innovating in those spaces, I think, will be a very interesting research topic going forward. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this because I want to do live demo. So uh, now it's like a different era of machine building. So the parts that I had you know, my, at my disposal when I was a graduate student eight million years ago, uh, <laughs> last year, are, are different now. Like there's a lot of new innovation that has happened in the space specifically because of, I think, consumer 3D printing. So a lot of the parts that took me a long time to order from China or different kinds of places, now you can just buy from Amazon Prime. Um, yeah, it's the, definitely makes me feel a little bit old sometimes, Neil, when my students say, oh yeah, for you, back in the day, all of this was very hard. 
um, but this is a uh, this is a, a sort of interchangeable platform that um, especially one of my students, Joshua Vasquez, has been working on, but also my other two students, Jasper Tran O'Leary and Hannah Twig Smith, and it has a tool changer. This is the um, this is the part that picks it up. Um, and I can show maybe this part. This is the kinematic mount um, that holds a tool. Um, and the, uh, one of the major parts in terms of thinking about, you know, who are the users for this kind of space? If you think back to the 90s, when you guys were all not born yet, uh, then software programming was like a new exciting thing and people making things with apps or making things um, that could run on your computer were sort of tinkerers. So you had people who worked on programming languages and then you had people who used computers and somewhere in between that space, there were these tinkerer people who, uh, who kind of were playing around with the possibilities but weren't necessarily building their own programming languages. Maybe this was Neil a little bit and then Neil a little bit also made, um, made his own programming languages. And that's sort of the space that I imagine now for machine builders, where you have some people who just walk into a fab lab and use the machines. You have some people who go into a fab lab and really design an entirely new machine from scratch. And then you have other people who sort of want to tinker around with modules and reconfigure things to have different machine parts. So Nadia, we're out of time. So if you can wrap up. Uh, I wanted to draw something for you guys. So here is a uh, my machine homing, home, and then I have to type something in the command prompts. I'm putting you down, uh, stream. Um, so I, yeah. So it picks up, ooh, it picks up the tools from this sort of parking station on the other side. This entire tool changer is open source hardware. And one of the major components about that that I've learned a lot since the uh, MTM snap is that making sure you can really replicate uh, the work that we do without necessarily relying on fancy tools. So all of the parts that you see here are built with um, Prusa 3D printers and an Arbor Press. Trusty, this is not an Arbor Press. And uh, these inset, these heat set inserts, here's just our little Prusa farm working away at it. Um, and I think that fabricability is an important thing to think about when you're working on open source hardware. What, is the, what, are the par what are the parameters where you can expect other people to be able to replicate your work given the tools that they have at their disposal? And so there's like this spectrum from, you know, you at home with no tools and a big industrial digital fabrication facility. And along that spectrum, how do you design and build for that space? Anyway, ah, I'm missing it. It picks up other tools. <laughs> okay, well, I will post the link for the tool changer online if you guys want to replicate it. Uh, this platform, by the way, is a modified Core XY. Um, That's great. So uh, do, yes. do send me a link for this link to your own uh, personal page. Um, Sorry? Uh, do send me links for the class oh, page. Oh, yeah, I will. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Uh